Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for coming to CSIS for a discussion today of uh, Chinese semiconductor industry, its plans, its intentions, its fate. Um, I, have, I told the speakers before we came out that they were kind of my dream team for talking about this topic. Uh, my name is Jim Lewis. I work here. Uh, but with me, we have uh, Rob Atkinson, who's the president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, one of the better think tanks on this stuff here in town. Um, I'm not going to read their full bios. They'll be online. And in any case, they're way too long. Um, Jimmy Goodrich, the Vice President, Global Policy Semiconductor Industry Association. Uh, Jimmy is kind of the person everyone sends reporters to when you want to talk about semiconductors. So he's, we're glad to have him here. And um, what the heck? Oh, here we go. I, I didn't yeah, have dream team, huh? Yeah. <laughs> no, I just, how can I read the thing? How can I read your bio? Uh, Aaron Nannis, who's the Senior Vice President at the U.S. China Business Council, and is one of Washington's uh, real experts on business in China. So uh, great lineup. What we're going to do here today is I've asked them all to speak for five or ten minutes or so on any topic they want. Rob was going to talk about his cuisine adventures last time he was in China. Um, we'll talk for five or ten minutes up here. Then we'll go to, I'll have a few questions. Then we'll have questions. We'll let people in the audience ask questions. So that's the plan. Um, Jimmy, why don't we start with you and just go right down the aisle, Aaron. That'll make you the last speaker. Okay, deal. Is that okay? So, Jimmy, go ahead. Sure. Thanks, Jim. And really uh, glad to be here. And I really commend you for putting together a tremendous report. I think you just released that today. So um, if folks haven't had time to read through it, I encourage you to do so. I think it's a good contribution, good overview of what's happening in China in this space. So I'm just going to give a couple of thoughts before we kick off the discussion. I think we're here more to talk with each other in a group and answer questions. Um, but starting at a higher level before we get to China, and I'll try and dive into that a little bit, I think it's important to remember when we're talking about semiconductors, and I'm working for the industry group, SIA, the Semiconductor <coughs> Industry Association. Um, we're actually in a very unique spot as an industry in that the United States still dominates the semiconductor industry today. And so whether it's market share or technology, US companies have about half of the worldwide market. Uh, in terms of technology, a lot of the leading processes, architecture, design, uh, five, seven nanometer chips are being designed or manufactured here in the United States. And those are incredible innovations uh, that are being done by U.S. companies. Uh, and, you know, because of that, it's actually a little known fact that the U.S. still produces chips here. It's actually our fourth largest export. Uh, we have manufacturing in about 19 states. Uh, and a very sustainable business model. On average, U.S. companies and, and this is true for many global companies as well, invest about 20% of their revenue uh, into R&D. Uh, and that's about neck and neck with pharmaceuticals for highest level of technology intensity by, by industry. So we're pretty well positioned today, at least from a US perspective, to uh, capture a lot of the new innovations and market share that's going to be coming with 5G or AI or, or other technologies down the road. Um, another sort of higher level um, you know, fact I think we need to consider when looking at the China angle is that the industry is incredibly global. So for any company or country, literally nobody can do it all on their own. Whether it's from chip design, it takes developers all around the world on a 24-hour cycle, whether it's manufacturing where a wafer might go from one country to the next four or five times around the world, literally before it gets shipped to customers. Uh, looking at inputs in the fab, a lot of materials, it's, it's incredibly global, if not the most global industry out there. And so for countries like China or others that are looking to do everything within their borders, that really defies the logic uh, of this industry and how we become successful. Uh, and then turning to China, before we get to what China is doing, just thinking about where China sits today in the global industry, whether you're an American, Japanese, Korean, or Taiwanese firm, China is central, if not absolutely critical, to, to both the market and the supply chain. So for the average chip company, 30 to 35 percent of their sales are, are coming from companies in China. That, that includes some multinationals, but by and large also uh, Chinese companies. Uh, and most of the world's electronic supply chain uh, has either been built up or migrated to China quite a long time ago. And those are the, you know, the companies that are assembling the electronics. And so most of our chips end up going to China, passing through China. Um, and uh, half of the China market today in terms of sales are actually to multinationals. So your Apple supply chain in China, your Dell, your et cetera. But the interesting fact is that for 
uh, dom domestic Chinese OEMs, these are the companies like Xiaomi that are doing mobile phones or DJI on the drone front, their compound annual growth is sometimes four or five X, those of their uh, multinational uh, competitors. So a lot of the growth prospects are there as well. Um, and so looking at then what actually China is doing uh, to build up their industry, um, it's important also to remember that uh, you know, where today the industry is, is strong globally, and China today is in a very weak position. And your report, I think, goes through that in a lot of detail, and I won't spend too much time on it, but just a couple of things uh, to remember is that today China's accounts are about 10% of worldwide ship sales. That's a very small number, and that's why they're throwing a lot of money to try and increase the number of uh, ships they can make domestically, and the Chinese leadership is also very blunt in talking about uh, the fact that they want to reduce reliance on, on foreign countries and companies. Uh, so in 2014, uh, the Chinese government put together a uh, national strategy. They coupled that with about $100 billion in state financing vehicles, whether it's provincial, national, local. Uh, and it, at first, um, the, the Beijing government uh, in, it, it thought, well, you know, why not uh, buy as many companies as we can. Better, better to buy than try and build on our own. It's a lot easier. And I think we know the story there. Um, uh, governments worldwide uh, erected a lot of barriers and made that almost impossible today for, for, for Chinese companies to, to do cross-border M&A in, in this industry. So about two years ago, the government had a reset and said, well, if we can't buy it, let's build it. And so now we see around um, 100 billion, roughly over five, six years, invested into domestic fabs. And that's semiconductor factories that are being built up, about uh, 30 to 40 of them. The vast majority of them, I think, are going to be um, uh, mothballed or, or, a, or a dramatic failure, but some in, some in there could be, um, particularly, say, in memory chips and also foundry manufacturing, could, could disrupt some parts of the industry, particularly uh, similar patterns we've seen where Chinese industrial policy has uh, directed itself at an industry, uh, ramped up domestic production through state subsidies, and had in some cases, over non-market overcapacity. And semiconductors are different than those, those sectors because we're highly diversified. One chip is not the same. And so it's very hard to have uh, an overcapacity glut industry writ large. Um, so again, uh, uh, very different um, um, from that aspect. Um, but I think stepping back um, from our perspective, um, you know, U.S. companies are not afraid of, of competition. You know, we're, we compete with each other every day, uh, worldwide in the United States. And, you know, amongst a lot of the Chinese companies, um, many of them are actually quite market-based and, and doing well on their own without government support. Um, it's that more smaller faction that's got some big state subsidies, and in particular where, um, you know, we think there needs to be a lot of improvements around the intellectual property protection and IP and ensuring that China builds its industry on the backs of its own IP, uh, not that of others. Um, and then just, you know, I think we can talk about this a little bit more uh, in the discussion, um, but I, I would like to turn a little bit when we can about, you know, what the response is. And, you know, I think ultimately, um, you know, we're not going to be able to stop China from building its own industry. They're, they're going, they are building their industry. They are going to increase their share of the market. And so we have to think hard about what are we going to do to maintain the lead? Because we're not like steel, aluminum, other sectors where they're trying to survive um, against Chinese dominant competition. Here we have the lead. We need to extend it, enhance it. And that's really through uh, doubling down on federal government research, ensuring that we have the, the workforce um, so that the next two, three nanometer development, the next uh, AI chip that's coming out of here in the U.S., and that's funded through U.S. research. Um, and that's how we can really, at the, at the end of the day, extend our lead uh, when it comes to China. So looking forward to the discussion with um, the rest of the group and, and have a lot more to share, but I'll stop there. Great. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, you've raised a number of the key issues that we will come back to in the discussion. Um, for those who are standing, there are chairs in the front. There's no extra charge for the front of the airplane. Um, Rob, please. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Jim. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. And I uh, really commend that you all read this report. I found it uh, both a very good framing of the issue and, and a lot of really good insights uh, into what's happening um, with Chinese semiconductors. I think one way to think about this issue is this is the single most important technology in the world 
Uh, everything else that we think about in going forward into this next technology wave, when people talk about 5G, AI, robotics, <laughs> autonomous systems, every one of those depends upon chip technology. And if chip technology stagnates and doesn't continue to innovate and progress at the past rates it's been doing, uh, we're going to see that not just in the semiconductor industry, we're going to see that in all the downstream industries. Uh, you know, I just bought a new washing machine yesterday because my old one didn't, my daughter's down there and it doesn't work, so I go to Best Buy, I get one. I don't know how many chips it's got in it, but it does all this amazing stuff that it couldn't do 10 years ago. Why is that an issue? Uh, it's an issue because it is incredibly hard to make progress in this industry now compared to, say, 40 or 50 years ago. There's a good study by Nick Bloom at Stanford and John Van Rienen where they looked at how hard, how easy it was, or how hard it's begun to, to do innovation in certain industries. And what they estimated was in 1970, assuming it took, say, for, you know, hypothetically, one engineer to get a Moore's Law progress, so Moore's Law doubling in 18 to 24 months of processing speed and half in price. Okay, that's one doubling. It took, let's say, one engineer. Today it takes 70 engineers. So this is super hard, super hard, and the hardness relates to how much money the companies need. You have to put an enormous amount of money into design, into R&D, and figuring out how to do that, and then to build the fab, I don't know what you mean, billions, or six, whatever it is. 10 to 15. 10 to 15 billion. So why does that matter? Why that matters is because the threat from China, and I would argue, by the way, this is virtually an artificial threat in the sense that they would not be developing a semiconductor industry without government industrial policy. There's no, sort of no natural way that they would do that. That threat, one of the biggest threats, and this is a point, Jim, you really made very well in the paper, that is going to have a negative effect if they're somewhat successful on uh, a negative effect on global innovation. And we could see it first in the DRAM market, where mm -hmm. let's there's, there's three major DRAM producers, Micron being one and two in Korea. Let's just say they're able to get in that market and, and they get enough out there even if, they just, even if they just serve the Chinese market and reduce sales in the U for the U.S., for Micron or, or, or Samsung or uh, SK Hynix, uh, that's going to mean lower margins for those three companies. That's going to mean they're going to not put as much money into R&D and doing the next generation. I read a fantastic book this summer on, on my summer vacation. It was a biography of Gordon Moore, which I encourage everybody to read. It's just a fascinating book. And one of the things you read that book, Gordon Moore, the one of the founders of Intel, one of the things you read that book is how often they bet the company. They were like, well, this one worked, but if we don't put all the money we made from this generation into this next generation, we're going to be in deep trouble. And luckily, they kept being able to do that. But that's the dynamic in this industry. It's not like the steel industry or the car industry, where you're not, not as much as riding on top of that. So I, I'm, I'm a little more. I, I get, I, I, first of all, I totally get that semiconductors is probably one of the hardest technologies for the Chinese to master. It, it's a combination of you have to understand the recipe and you've got to be a really skilled cook with the right tools. All three hard to do, you know, compared to some other areas. Even, even biotech, I mean, the Chinese are pretty far ahead on technologies like CRISPR. So I get that this is hard. But I think we're making a mistake if we assume they can never do it, that this is just too hard for them to do. Because the Chinese have gone after hard technology problems in the past. Uh, for, you know, for example, um, aviation, now they're, they're, they're making a, essentially the equivalent of 737. A high speed rail, they're the, the world leader in that. Certainly a telecom equipment with Huawei. Uh, supercomputers, they was always this, are we ahead this week, are they ahead? Quantum, they're getting into that. So I don't think we should just sort of automatically rule out that this one's so hard they can't ever do. This one is hard, it's gonna be harder for them, it'll take them longer. But if we sort of just you know, fall asleep, and this is one point, Jim, I, I guess I had a slightly different take where your point about them, it's hard because they don't have the talent. But from some of the folks I've been talking to, they're able to buy that talent from Korea and Taiwan in particular, that at least somebody told me a story where there are flights coming in from Taipei and Seoul every Monday morning with a whole bunch of engineers who get laid off from Samsung maybe or whatever. And they come to these factories or these R&D facilities, and then Friday night they get on the plane, the chauffeur drives them all to the plane, and they go home. There was one of these places, the guy told me, again, I have no reason to doubt why he told me, that he told me this, but he said he was visiting one of these places, and there was actually, they had built a church 
on the campus of the factory or the facility because several of the engineers from Korea or Taiwan were Christians. So they went so far to build a church because they wanted these people so badly. So I think you can get talent, it's harder, but, uh, and then the same way with training people here and bringing them back, and then their Thousand Talents program. So uh, I think it's hard, but I don't think we should just be blasé about the challenge. Smick, if you're wondering with a company that has the church. But no, thanks, Rob. Uh, Aaron, uh, please. So I'm the generalist on this panel, and uh, Jim thankfully gave me some parameters that I could um, do almost anything with. So my task really is to talk a little bit just generally about how China develops industrial policies, what it means, and what the context is of it. And I think it's important to keep in mind uh, why companies view China as important. It's not just because you can produce a lot of stuff there and, uh, with semiconductors or, or in any other nature and ship it out. It's a massive market in and of itself, and companies like to be close to where their customers are. So the, that dynamic will not change regardless of kind of what one industry is doing or not. And companies that are participating in the market have an incentive to want to figure out how to tap into whatever the government is in that area is trying to promote, particularly if they have um, innovative products that are going to be able to deliver in that market. So with that as a context, let me tell you a little bit about how China comes up with the plans of how it focuses on individual industries. I, I think probably at, at its most basic, the way to consider this is China likes to plan. It, they've got five-year plans that set out broad national goals. Those five-year plans are then taken by every ministry in China and every provincial government, and they come up with their own five-year plan to implement every aspect of it. There are other policies that come out that are more specified. Made in China 2025 is one that we talk about a lot um, currently, but previous programs have been everything from China's indigenous innovation uh, policies, which started around uh, the early 2000s, to um, its uh, less talked about cousin these days, the strategic emerging industries. For each of these, the important thing to keep in mind, particularly for Americans, since we don't spend a whole lot of time doing strategic planning, is that just because China has a plan doesn't mean that it's gonna have a 100% success rate in implementing it. But if you are a practitioner of strategic planning, you know that what you do throughout that process is constantly evolve what your targets are, what's achievable, which industries are the ones that you think are doing better that you can redirect your policies towards. And we've seen those evolutions over the years that has led to things like Made in China 2025. As I mentioned, kind of that progression, indigenous innovation was a policy that actually started as a pilot program in many provinces in China to try to develop domestic companies that had IP made in China as the basis for whatever the future products were going to be. Um, it caused a lot of fervor because it had some policies in it that were contrary both to China's WTO commitments and frankly contrary to how innovation happens around the world. You can't force a company to localize. Uh, innovation crosses those borders for a reason. But that then honed itself into programs such as strategic emerging industries. This was a program that China announced around 2011. It had nine sectors that China was going to be a leader in. Uh, it included everything from new energy vehicles to biotechnology, all areas that China continues to evolve in, but really the market itself is driving those issues, really not so much Chinese companies at this point. The most recent iteration in Made in China 2025 has 10 sectors that are in it. Many of them overlap with what was in strategic emerging industries. They certainly have goals on things like indigenous innovation. So the evolution and the constant movement of these policies towards getting more specific, but also focusing on the areas where they become more important or where China has found that it is able to innovate and to be a leader in really is where the focus is. I think that drive, that desire to innovate, to be a global leader, to not be overly dependent upon foreign countries, whether it's the United States or anyone else, that really helps to inform how some of these decisions are made. Now, you can set up a strategic plan that does all kinds of things, but um, really, as, as Jimmy and Rob have pointed out, how you fund it really depends a, a great deal on how successful you might be in those areas. And I, I think in this one, the other aspect to keep in mind about how China's system is done is 
you might have a policy come out that is a Chinese policy, but not necessarily all agencies within the Chinese government agree with it. Uh, certainly a program like Made in China 2025, which is very much a, an industrial policy type, we hear a lot more support of those kinds of programs coming from um, the Ministry of uh, Industry and Information Technology and the National Development Reform Commission, so the, the state planners, than you hear from the Ministry of Finance or from the Ministry of Commerce, where they view competition as something that can help promote those issues. Mm -hmm. But not only is there not always a consensus on how these policies come out, there's also not always one way that these things are funded. Uh, what we saw with strategic emerging industries is despite the fact that there were national government policies that stated that the government was going to put massive amounts of money into developing these sectors, those, the actual funds were expected to come from provincial governments. Uh, we've seen initiatives from China to promote small and medium-sized enterprises that have been directives to Chinese banks to loan to those industries. So this combination of both um, general subsidies from the government, a desire to potentially have the market help in terms of bank financing these issues, and where those things um, intersect, you can sometimes see all of these elements coming together. Now, in the case of an industry like semiconductors, where it has a lot of these boxes that get checked, it's an area where China wants to innovate, it's an area where China wants to be a, viewed as a global leader, and it has significant concerns about being overly dependent on others. You see a lot more central government financing being committed to it. But I guess I would say, more generally, when you're looking at these industries, not every industry that China targets is going to be semiconductors. But you can see the patterns and how it evolves. And that's among the reasons why, between the United States and other governments that deal with these issues, we also need to be nimble in thinking about how they're prioritizing. Because not everything is generally going to be competitive. We need to focus more on the ones where the, where the challenges really will exist. Great. Thank you, Erin. Um, that was a great lead into the discussion. I'm going to ask a few questions and we'll turn to you. Um, my first question is, um, is the Chinese government a help or a hindrance when it comes to building these industries? Uh, in some ways, when I see the growing involvement of the party in planning and in a very granular level in businesses, I'm actually grateful because it probably slows the Chinese down, but I don't I don't uh, know what you think about that, but when you think about the Chinese government programs here, help or hindrance? So why don't we start with you, Jimmy? Well, I think also picking up on where Aaron left off in terms of the financing, <coughs> you know, what, what the industrial policy that China has structured in the semiconductor space is, you know, I think if you look at bio or aviation, it's certainly mm -hmm. different and unique. And, and first, it, the scale is extremely large compared to other sectors. We're talking about, again, over $100 billion in capital that's being invested. A lot of that's going to be wasted, but the scale is certainly large. So even if you have a 25% success rate, you're still looking at um, a dent in certain parts uh, of the industry. And, and that's really unique in that several years ago, the Chinese state set up something called the National Integrated Circuits Investment Fund. And this is uh, unique from their perspective where as opposed to taking the government finance uh, uh, reserves straight from the treasury direct into the companies, they set up a private equity investment model where they'd bring in professionals from the outside, many of them tend to be from government banks, to monitor the performance of these companies so that at the minimum, even though it's government financing, they're trying to make sure what's being spent is being used wisely. Uh, and so you can see here the Chinese state trying to improve the efficiency of their plan really building on the lessons they learned in other sectors where they were not as successful, like in LEDs or solars, where you had just uh, you know, very simple subsidies going out with zero accountability. And so you can see here in semiconductors a, a change here with their, with their state plan. The interesting thing, though, is several years ago I was in uh, uh, China right when the plan was being rolled out and talking to a group of the domestic semiconductor CEOs in China. And you know, one of them came up to me and said, I don't want a cent of this money. Uh, because as soon as you bring in the government as an investor, as a shareholder, they've got all sorts of crazy ideas of what we should do when we know better than they do about what the market wants, what the technology is, where they need to compete. Um, now, four years later, sorry, three years later, he actually did take investment from the National IC Fund. And I asked him why he should do it. And he said, well, everyone else did. So I had to be on level playing field with my competitors. Um, the interesting thing, though, is if you look at 
the single most successful chip company in China, and, and that's, I think, without doubt, High Silicon, the design arm of, of Huawei. Uh, they don't have any of that support from the state. I mean, they've got the average tax breaks that any other company has, but they haven't taken subsidies from the central government. They haven't gotten big loans, and they've really done a lot of it on their own. And so it really, like Alibaba being developed on its own without state support, certainly they had the uh, firewall to help, but, you know, oftentimes we see some of the most innovative companies coming out of the sort of bamboo shoots without that government support. And so, you know, I think for China, really if they wanted to be successful, they have to really let the market decide who's going to be the winner and loser. Uh, and, and that, if they follow that path, it'll also be easier uh, and, and less disruptive on the global industry. So I agree with Jimmy on that. I, I think that Chinese government officials are not stupid people and they're, they're they're, they're like voracious learners, and they, they study every country in the world to understand how their innovation policies and systems work, and then they try to incorporate that. Now, they're not always nimble. It takes them a while, but they usually get there. And uh, I remember having a meeting with a high-level NDRC official a number of years ago, and we were talking about this, and he said, there have been a number of tragedies in China, and I thought, Earthquakes, uh, floods, what do you mean? He goes, well, we put an enormous amount of money into building up the VCR industry right before the DVDs came on the market. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was like they just wasted, and you know, whatever they spent, it was just might have been down the toilet. But he said, we've learned from that. I mean, again, they're not stupid. They, 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 oh yeah, that was bad. And so, you know, partly through this, what I would call money laundering scheme they have, um, through these private equity groups. But, you know, interesting, I was reading a study recently that uh, showed, or purported to show, that if you add up all of the money that the governments, state, uh, provincial and, and federal, national mostly, it put into these private equity funds, and then the commitments made and all that, which uh, they're not gonna get there. I think we should call them public equity, because they're still state-owned. Some are private, but yeah, yeah most are state-owned, but yeah whatever you want to call it, uh, equity funds to invest in, in companies' equity, uh, the amount is 40% of global VC, and it is more than the gross domestic product of the country of the Netherlands. So I don't care how, uh, unless you're 99% inefficient, some of that's going to stick to the wall, and, and that's what I worry about. I mean, just add on to that, you know, I was in a, a city in southern China last year, and they're building a $5.5 billion semiconductor fab and it's the local mayor's project, basically. Every mayor wants to have a fab. And I asked him, why build a semiconductor fab? And he said, well, you know, our industry is the worldwide center of footwear, uh, sportswear for tennis shoe production. Uh, and so we can't compete anymore. We need, a, we need to find higher paying jobs. So we're going to build a semiconductor factory. And he said, well, it also, what, we've got this brilliant plan where we're going to make sure that everyone who manufacturers a tennis shoe in our city is going to put one of their chips in it because there's going to be wearable electronics. And so you've got these kind of uh, creative ideas coming out of mayors to build these cities, but it, uh, these semiconductor fabs, but what do they really know about the market? I, Sometimes I, almost nothing. Yeah, I guess I would, that's actually a great <coughs> point, and I think we, you need to keep in mind that the Simply throwing money at an issue doesn't necessarily guarantee success, much like making a plan doesn't, doesn't make it a success. I, I think where some of the, the distortions come from China, in addition to putting large amounts of money in, is when you have sectors where China sets targets for what its both domestic market share or global market share is. Now, we can have a discussion about whether that in itself is um, counter to what global policies should be. But at a minimum, when you have that combination of significant amounts of largely um, subsidized money and industries that could use that money to do things, you have a combination that can very easily lead to overcapacity. It's how you get to things like overcapacity in steel. Uh, in many ways, we look at the Made in China 2025 program and all of those sectors that if all of that money genuinely ends up in them and China seeks to um, make sure that it's dominating the market. Simply having international companies come in and begin producing in China versus where their global supply chain might have other na otherwise naturally taken them, you are doing, you might be able to capture the market share, but you're doing so by so increasing the size of the market that now there's not as many customers for it. So in general, I would say, uh, you know, from, from, from my perspective, the government isn't 
a completely a hindrance, but it certainly doesn't give you any great sense of success that's going to come out of how they, how they focus. Can I say one quickly? Sure. So I, I think the thing that we, we tend to look at China from our own sort of perspective, which is kind of neoclassical economics, and you want to have allocation efficiency, and you don't really want waste. That's not the way to look at this. Okay? They're willing to blow an enormous amount of money. There's a new study that just came, actually an economist article based, I think, on a World Bank study. And it showed that if you know what total factor productivity is, total factor productivity is basically all of the inputs to output, so energy, capital goods, labor. Uh, total factor productivity, according to the study, is down, and it's been going down every year since 2009 when they started blowing all this money in infrastructure. And now total factor productivity in China is the same as it was in 2000. So that's shocking. But at one level, it's irrelevant because somebody, the Chinese consumers or the Chinese people, are paying for that. And then they're subsidizing all these companies. And so you look at solar, for example, where in 2000 we had something like 50% of the solar industry in the world, the PV panels. Now we have five, and the Chinese have 55. Uh, they did that through an enormous amount of waste. I mean, enormous amount of waste, but it got them a globally competitive solar industry. We see it in, uh, in high-speed rail. We see it in the fact that I, I think Washington, D.C. wants to buy Chinese rail cars for the metro. Well, those are massively subsidized. So I, again, I, we shouldn't look at it from an efficiency model because they're incredibly inefficient. But when you put enough money into something, you can get results. But I do want to, I, I think it's important to also think, you know, understand that the, the level of technology going into the production and the design of a chip is fundamentally different and sure. on, a, on a tremendous sort of 10x scale in terms of complexity when you compare it to more traditional industry like solar or high-speed rail. And so I think, I think we have to really understand that and recognize that the success ratio is going to be dramatically reduced. Uh, because no, I agree with it. I, that's what I said initially. This is the hardest industry for them to do, and it is going to be hard for them. But I just, I, I just caution us against sort of being too overconfident that they'll never do it. Yeah. I, I think, frankly, one thing driving is just prestige as well, and that it's hard, so they want to try. Uh, and you know, I think China has this sense that they're the you know world's largest country. They've got this manufacturing supply chain there. They they need to have this industry, and that's their view. Um, and they just put a. You know, they put a probe on the backside of the moon that nobody's ever done before. And Prestige. I don't, I don't think anybody thinks that China won't be successful in some way. I think the question is, uh, the rate of change, and the effect on the market, and the rules that China follows when it does improve. And that latter point is a crucial one. But maybe I can start with Rob on my second question, which is, maybe ten years ago there was still a debate about whether China had an indigenous ability to innovate. I think that debate was over. No one would say now the Chinese cannot innovate. But when you go to China, what you hear in private is a concern that the political narrowing will somehow damage this innovation capability. So let me, st I'll start with Rob and then we'll go to Aaron and down the row. How's Chinese politics going to shape their ability to innovate, their ability to create high technology? They have policies on innovation and technology, but they have other policies that may create drag. So, Rob? Yeah, so it's a little bit like if you have a giant tractor pulling, uh, you go to a tractor pull pulling like a, a one-ton piece of cement, and the question is, you have a more powerful tractor than the cement drag, and uh, so far the tractor is more powerful than the drag, I would, I would say. Um, I don't know, I just, <laughs> I just think, I just keep thinking on this that uh, the fundamental issue here is not about whether they're going to be able to do it or not. The fundamental issue is about how they're doing it. And that's what we have to confront. So, I, and I, I think the Chinese can, can make progress. I, I don't think that the current sort of limitations and what the government's doing. I mean, the Chinese, by the way, the other thing about it, they're very good at engineering innovation. Again, when we think of innovation, we tend to think of cutting edge global science innovation. That's one kind of innovation. Engineering-based innovation is another that's pretty critical. I mean, the Germans are super good at engineering-based innovation. They're better than we are, for example, and they're a very successful economy. Chinese are good at engineering, so I don't think we should dis dismiss that. Um, well, this is very science-intensive. Pardon? This is very science-intensive. Well, this is both, though. I mean, this is, this is both. Again, I'm not, I'm not, there's a lot of engineering in this, as, as, as there is a lot of science. So. Um, Anyway, I'll stop there. Okay, Aaron. I, I guess the, the 
reality is, is that Chinese politics affects almost everything. I mean, that, that is the nature probably of any government's politics. There's very few governments that have no hand in um, trying to promote certain areas. I, I will um, disagree with Rob on the idea, though, that being able to put a lot of money into this means that there is, that we are dealing with something that basic economics isn't still going to be proven true. Economics is not theory. China is spending large amounts of money to try to promote these industries. And the key question really is how fast can they do it? But it is not sustainable to subsidize industries simply because you want to be a leader in them. They are going to have to be able to survive on their own. And whether that is, you know, a, a VCR versus online, you know, I'm sure the folks who made Betamax are wishing themselves they had the best technology, but they didn't make it on a scale that anybody really wanted to buy. That's the, that's the challenge is, can the government stay far enough away from this to, in semiconductors or any other sector, to allow companies to innovate on a way that makes them competitive globally and not distort what's happening by simply allowing the flow of free money to be too heavy? Mm -hmm. I think one thing that's it's important to consider is that when you think about innovation, it's one thing to be able to innovate the technology, it's another to be able to commercialize it. And so if you look at a lot of the state-backed projects that China has, whether it's their 863 or their mega projects, um, they're actually able to do a lot of really innovative things, but they're for strategic applications, usually limited to a government application. So for example, uh, inside China's fastest supercomputer are Chinese developed and manufactured microprocessors and they've been able to power that supercomputer which which is at, you know running some of the world's most advanced software but those chips have failed to be able to uh, commercialize anywhere in the market let alone within China because they're too expensive and they're specific to that one system that they've built to win that race um, and like uh, you know another area for example uh, China has very sophisticated uh, sensors and imaging chips for their satellites um, but they haven't been able to uh, make, the, make their chips they use for their Beidou GPS, for example, to compete on the market with GPS. Uh, and that's you know because cost efficiency, market bearing, all those things, um, they've really gotten completely wrong on those systems. But they never really intended them to. They were for government applications. And so I think you know, where China is, has the biggest challenge is figuring out how do they take that state planned, actually they call it in Chinese the zhu uh, guo teacher, or the sort of state mobilized effort um, like they do to try and pump out gold medals uh, at all costs um, means that you're not entirely going to be successful in the commercial market. Uh, it's, it's not a given, I, I think. And so, you know, particularly sometimes when the U.S. government looks at China and high tech and, for example, in semiconductors and they see these pockets of really innovative success, they might assume, well, that's going to translate over to, you know, commercial DRAM chips or the commercial competitive foundry. And again, it's one thing to innovate for strategic technology purposes is another to commercialize it, win market share, uh, sort of, and, and predict what's the next ch technology shift happening in the market that you need to be on top of. So I, I think those are two very different things. I think the other thing we have to think about, and, and, and Jim, you talked a little bit about it in the report. Um, one of the reasons the U.S. has been able to stay ahead, and one reason Intel kept staying ahead, is because innovation kept progressing at a fairly rapid rate, and so we could be two generations ahead of the Chinese. You can master that two generations ago chip, and it sort of doesn't really matter. It's sort of like saying, hey, I can sell you an iPhone 2, do you want it? That doesn't appear to be, that, that, that appears to be changing, that, that, that the process of, of the speed of which the sort of innovation frontier is, is going is slowing down, which means the Chinese have a little bit more ability to catch up. And secondly, it appears that a lot of the future demand in chips is gonna be somewhat more commodity-based. So if you think about 5G systems or IoT chips, there's gonna be a lot, IoT chips aren't super complicated. Uh, it's not to say that they're not, it's not to say that you don't have still innovation, but I, I think it's, you know, that to me is why it's so important that we have to have a domestic innovation policy that allows and enables our companies to keep going at a super fast pace. Did you wanna add anything, Aaron? No. We can go. So um, you've all touched on this a couple times and we've been all, four of us have been watching this industry for a while and so for me this is the third or fourth time that we've seen the movie Chinese government announces we'll build chip industry and you know Jimmy's point about the mayor wanting thing I used to have a collection of pictures of mayors standing in front of fab shaking their hands and then two years later the fab is shuttered 
and it never really made anything. Is this time different? I mean, we've seen this movie before. Lots of money, government policy, focus at the local levels, and it doesn't work out. Is this one different? Jimmy, why don't we start with you? I'd say yes, the level of capital is 10x what it was okay. um, in the early 2000s. In the, in the late early 90s when they had their first and second sort of attempt at, at the industry. And then the attention at a political level is much higher. In the past you had, you have China's Politburo, mm -hmm. you have the General Secretary. Um, generally it was one of the Politburo members who kind of took on this industry as their pet project and pushed forward some of the imperatives. Here you've got very clearly Xi Jinping saying, I want a chip industry, standing in semiconductor fab saying, I want you to boost production. You need to do this faster, quicker. And partly that's because of the political environment globally as well. Um, and I think, I think that's certainly having an impact on this. But again, uh, I think many of the same factors that led to um, lack of progress and success before are still there. And they haven't uh, done those fundamental reforms to uh, engage in privatization, increase transparency in the market, uh, level the playing field, increase in p the protection of intellectual property. Those are the things that they need to do, I think. And that, that makes it so competition with Chinese and uh, multinational companies in China is on that level playing field. Today, we still have those, those issues that are vestiges of decades before that haven't changed. Erin, did you want to pick up on that? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, in some ways, I don't think that we should ever assume that any policy is always going to be ineffective because it, was, because it has been in the past. I think Jimmy makes an important point. The global context in which this is happening now is very different in and of itself. So China is not simply interested in trying to develop a semiconductor industry because they want to be a global leader in semiconductors. They want to be a leader in global semiconductors because they are seeing threats to what their access to that technology might be and they are seeking solutions that will ensure that not only do they maintain employment and uh, kind of cutting edge technology they can bring to it, but because cutting off of that access from some of their major trading partners would be disastrous for their economy. So really that also then leads to the fact that whether the policies are successful independently can't be determined if we don't know what that global context is. It, are we in a world where the, the U.S. successfully puts in export controls that our trading partners agree with and so there is a stemming of the flow of those products into China? Or is the world where the U.S. acts unilaterally and there is no stemming of that flow? Those could all make a determination. Great. Rob, did you want to? We should come back to that point because I think the, the, one of the problems I see is this is not the U.S. of 20 years ago. And so we may not be as competitive in some ways as we were. And we can talk about that more, but Rob, maybe that's a... Well, I, I just agree with everything Jimmy said, and I would add one more component to it. So success, if you're a follower and you're not a leader in innovation, depends on a lot of things. But one of the things it depends upon is just sort of your indigenous capabilities of your scientists and engineers mm -hmm. and technical workforce. They, they, they can't just be you know, really down here. They need to be here. And that's been a lot better in China. Ten years ago, they're, they're, they're better than they were ten years ago, and in ten years, they're going to be better than where they are today. So I don't think we could, we could ignore that. Um, I, I disagree a little bit with Aaron on the export control thing, uh, but we can talk about that some more. Uh, why don't we see if there are any questions in the audience? I have more. Just hold up your hand. Please identify yourself. I think you should wait for a microphone because we have a huge online audience watching this. So uh, why don't we start up front and just go down and around? Is that okay? Thanks. So, uh, Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant. Uh, to take a specific uh, case which touches on everything you said, uh, how about uh, what are your comments about this Chinese plan for the so-called Greater Bay Area, where they're going to uh, unify, you know, this whole area around uh, Hong Kong? into uh, and, and draw on the uh, features of each one. For instance, you mentioned uh, the commercialization. So their idea is, well, Hong Kong is going to be so, is so strong in finances, so they're going to be the financial component of this. And then Shenzhen is a massive in manufacturing, and then the other areas are doing things. It's seem, and the whole thing is on a tremendous scale. And, and just to follow on that, uh, the idea of this, I, the name Bay Area, I mean, they cop the name, but uh, it could comment also on, on how they're, they're, they're trying to catch up with foreign targets. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's one way they orient themselves. For instance, the idea that they're trying to displace NVIDIA from its position in the AI 
and that would involve the chips too. Okay, Aaron, do you want to start with that one? Or? Um, the, the Bay Area policy is relatively new, so we haven't looked at it in depth, so I will say, I'll just go back to what I had started with, and that is um, having a plan doesn't guarantee its success. Certainly, mm. the Chinese have correctly identified where this, the strengths are in each of those areas, whether that actually can come together in the type of cohesive, effective region is to be determined. Rob? Well, well. Oh, uh, Jimmy? I just had, you know, the question on, on uh, semiconductors for AI, you know, particularly in the area of graphics processors, which is the technology you mentioned, that's actually one of the areas where the gap is the farthest. Um, and, you know, in the, you know, types of GPUs that are being developed today, you're looking at billions of transistors at seven, five, seven nanometer, for example, right now, the most advanced ones, and that takes five, 6,000 engineers. Literally right now, to tape out one of those chips, it costs around 500 million to $700 million. Uh, and, and that's actually where the gap is the longest vis-a-vis uh, -vis Chinese competitors. Actually, the one company in China that does this is about seven generations behind uh, the world leaders in this space. Um, so, you know, I think, for example, there was a press article last year that said oh, China's got a plan to replace X company and, and GPUs. And, you know, again, stemming upon Aaron, if you actually think about what it takes to do that, um, haven't yet seen the resources being put at doing so. And again, um, you know, we ha had one, one of our members actually say, you know, they're trying to take 5% market share away from their U.S. competitor and they're throwing billions of dollars every year to try and do that. And then maybe if they're lucky, they get one and a half percentage points away from that U.S. competitor. And so to entirely um, replace a foreign company in the China market in the chip space is gonna be very hard to do, particularly when you get to the very high value add segments like logic, uh, some of the very boutique analog chips, um, some of the new memories that are coming out, uh, 3D stacking, very, very, very difficult things to do. I will say that one place where I think we have a question uh, there, Daniel, one place where I think the Chinese do have an advantage is they don't have the angst about spending on public goods like infrastructure and research that we have here. And so that could be a place where not so much that China speeds up, but that we slow down. But please identify yourself and ask your question. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Hal Hodson from The Economist. Uh, two very short questions. Fabs are clearly important in this discussion. Um, do you see any evidence that TSMC treats Chinese fabless IC designers differently than ones from other parts of the world? And secondly, what do you see as the benefits of the potential for the reduction of cost in ICs coming out of China in the same kind of way as we see in solar panels? That's a good one. Anyone want to go first? <laughs> I guess, you know, I can't comment specifically on the perspective from TSMC, but, you know, from the, uh, if you're looking at the fabulous industry worldwide, uh, North American fabulous companies are about 60, 70 percent uh, of the industry. Um, there are a lot of fabulous companies in China. Supposedly, the Chinese statistics say it's in upwards of 2,000, but you have a lot of tiny, tiny, tiny firms. Um, but they're a fast-growing revenue segment of the market, and much of what those Chinese fabulous companies are doing are things like sensors for your microwave or um, stuff that's going to measure the pressure in your tire and so on. And you've got, again, advanced companies like High Silicon, but uh, a lot of the um, Chinese fabulous companies are in that IoT space, uh, and, and that's an important revenue driver for the global uh, foundry industry. And, and in many cases, again, like with a lot of our customers, the fastest growing segment. Um, so, so I think, again, um, you know, like with any really economic industry across the globe, Chinese companies are going to play a pretty integral part to whichever segment it is. I haven't seen any evidence of uh, favoritism at TSMC, but there is, I think, a concern that given their location and the growing Chinese influence, that could change. When I was in graduate school, they taught us, you can tell where I went, they taught us that if people want to subsidize a product, you should accept that, that basically they're, it's people giving you money, a uh, very Chicago school. Um, and I was always a little uncomfortable with that argument, and it's certainly not one that's popular in Washington. So lower price at what cost? And that's, I think, what you see with a lot of the debates over this. And I think to add to that, to your second question, which is, you know, take uh, electric vehicle batteries or uh, solar panel uh, as well. Certainly the price came down. You saw um, 
uh, benefits to some consumers because of that, but there is also an argument that it crowded out a lot of innovative and interesting new technologies. Uh, so for example, in the EV space, um, you know, I know CSIS has done a lot of work here um, mm -hmm. to look at CATL and some of the other battery companies in China where they're basically throwing their weight behind the lowest uh, margin, cheapest cost effective technology strategy and crowding out all other types of technology that actually does have promise, maybe more efficient, maybe a little bit more expensive, but um, it actually holds a lot of innovation promise. I don't know, Rob, you've done, done work in this yeah, space so, too. I mean, if you look at batteries, for example, I, I, you know, we're never going to decarbonize the world with, I, maybe I should say that. It's going to be hard, I think, hard to decarbonize the world with lithium. I think lithium is, is, is a, is a cul-de-sac. Uh, you can only get so much improvement from scaling, and I think we're going to need alternative chemistries. Oh, not working. Oh. And um, all right, sorry. And, and if you look at solar, it's the same thing. ITIF wrote a report a number of years ago looking at the patenting. Sorry, the um, yeah the patent rate in uh, solar and wind companies around the world, and U.S. and Danish and German solar and wind companies were patenting on the order twenty times more than Chinese companies. So China basically stole the market with subsidies and they put out of business an enormous number of really innovative solar panel companies. <clears throat> and as a result, as Jimmy said, <clears throat> you got a short-term benefit from cheaper solar panels. But solar panels are not good enough to decarbonize the world right now. You cannot decarbonize given the existing technology. You have to get another generation or two of innovation there. And that's what I worry about. And that's a conversation <clears throat> excuse me, that we don't really have very much in this space. We tend to think about it in a bilateral way. What's China doing to us? What are we doing? And I think that's the too narrow a way to look at it. We have to look at it as what is happening to the global innovation process in all these industries. And I think Chinese innovation mercantilist policies can and have had significant harm to that innovation dynamic at the global scale. So I think one of the things we'd probably want to talk about is that Subsidies mean lower prices, but they come perhaps with unacceptable externalities, that would be the term. And f certainly for the solar panel one, I think something that hasn't come up is um, a lot of that had to do with espionage. German officials told me that their, their alternate energy industry was hollowed out by Chinese espionage. So it's the combination of subsidies and espionage. Aaron, do you want to jump in on this one? I will leave this one to you. Okay, uh, we got one more there, and then we go, we'll go, we'll, we'll get the whole room, we got plenty By of time. Way, I, just, I would just add, if we had good, li better lithium batteries, it wouldn't say on my thing, dead battery. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome um, to CSIS. <laughs> go ahead, please. Please in yeah. introduce yourself. Thank you for being here today. Um, Isabel Hoagland with Inside U.S. Trade. Um, White House Economic Advisor Larry Kudlow this morning said documents part of the U.S.-China deal include, quote, a de-emphasis on Beijing's Made in 20, China 2025 program, and um, the significant reduction of China subsidies to target those industries is part of those documents, he said. Do you have any idea what this language looks like, and if not, what commitments should be included, specifically as it relates to semiconductors? Do you think this will be an effective way to address the Chinese government's program? Aaron, do you want to do that one? Sure, I won't. I'll let Jimmy and others talk yeah. about the semiconductor aspect of it. Um, we have already seen China's government back away from um, touting Made in China 2025 as vociferously in recent months because of the global attention um, that it got and the concerns about how it was being perceived. That may also be a reflection of the fact that it was one of those policies that wasn't fully bought into by all, by all Chinese government agencies. I think the key is in that and in any other sector, um, and the reason why the details are so important between not just U.S.-China agreements but any agreement of this nature is that the agreement needs to not be so specific to an individual program that there is the wiggle room to say, well, I've stopped subsidizing this under Made in China 2025, but the subsidies then resume in other areas. There is no way to do that with a one-time agreement. That, that is the kind of commitment that you need that will require not just ongoing, um, I think we're calling them ongoing meetings rather than dialogue these days, but also regular, <laughs> regular engagement with industry about what they are seeing and you know, good intel on what's happening in the market. So you know, we are pleased that all of those are things that are being discussed by the two governments. 
Um, the reality that Made in China 2025 is being de-emphasized is, um, I would say, generally good, but we need to be aware of what could take its place and what needs to be done to address its, the distortions from those programs, not just the named programs. So I, I would argue if we don't have a strong and enforceable subsidy regime in the agreement that it's not really worth all that much. Uh, it needs that and it needs IP and tech transfer and IP theft. Those are the two main things in my, uh, market access to. But if you think about, I think the way we should think about this <clears throat> is how we, the OECD has an export subsidy regime, which the U.S. is a part of. And so our Exim Bank subsidies or investments, uh, there's a limit on how much you can do. And we abide by it. The Canadians more or less abide by it. The Europeans abide by it. The Chinese do not. And the last time I looked at this, the Chinese were 10 times over the limit. So I think we should say to China, get in an OECD subsidy regime of, in one way, shape, or form, and we expect you to, we're not going to say you can't ever subsidize. They're always going to subsidize, but it really needs to come down, in my view, at least 80 percent, maybe 90 percent. And it needs to be, I, I actually, I thought Light, Lighthizer's point about a sort of quarterly or monthly updates and then quarterly and semi-annual, that's the level of oversight we have to engage in. And if we're not seeing pretty rapid progress to bring that down and then stay down, then we have to be willing to go back and take uh, pretty strong action against them, uh, would, be, uh, would be my view. So I, I think the fact that they're making progress on those really key structural issues is a positive sign. Um, you know, whether it's uh, subsidies, intellectual property theft, forced tech transfer, those are the issues that our industry thinks are really critical when it comes to the trade relationship with China. And, uh, you know, a, a focus on deficit or purchases really is just a big distraction from, from those issues. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's tangible ways that the negotiators on both sides could really make some progress. First, when it comes to the issue of subsidies, transparency, number one, is, is really a good stepping stone to trying to come up with something more um, rigorous in that, for example, I mentioned China has all of these massive semiconductor funds. They haven't notified any of them to the WTO, which is one of their, one of their basic obligations. They don't even admit that they're a government subsidy. Uh, and then when it comes to intellectual property uh, protection, you know, there's been some positive steps in China so far, but there certainly could be a lot more when it comes to uh, providing you know, uh, a level playing field inside the courts, uh, increasing criminal enforcement, um, and you know, I think trying to get the 2015 cyber agreement back to a good place would also be a significant improvement, not just for us, but these are issues that any high-tech company from the United States faces. I think you can see there's a degree of skepticism regarding any agreement, particularly if there's no compliance or penalty mechanisms involved. But why don't we go on this side and then start here. Please hold your hand up and identify yourself. Hi, I'm Alex Hammer from the U.S. International Trade Commission. First of all, thanks very much for all your great insight today. And you all have been talking very much about the competitive elements between the U.S. and China, the semiconductor industry. But what about the mutual dependence? Um, you think about U.S. manufacturing, offshoring in China. For a lot of the semiconductor, the U.S. headquartered semiconductor firms that are doing a lot of manufacturing there, you think about all the U.S. exports going into semiconductor manufacturing equipment. If you could just comment on that dependence element, I'd uh, sure appreciate it. Thank you. I don't know who wants to go. I can take that. Okay, and then we'll go down sure. the road. I mean, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, the semiconductor <coughs> industry is arguably the most globally uh, dispersed and integrated sector. And so there's no one country or company that really can do all of this on their own. And so whether it's upstream, downstream, you've got countries relying on each other all across the value chain. Um, actually, when it comes to China, um, there aren't actually a significant amount of U.S. front-end semiconductor factories in China. There's, there's one or two, but um, that's roughly less than 10 percent of our global manufacturing footprint is in China. You actually see a much higher, um, again, 50 percent of manufacturing for U.S. companies is still in the U.S. Uh, and then really on the list of uh, big, big countries where we do that type of operation is in Japan, uh, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, Germany, Israel. Uh, countries where you have um, uh, high educated workforce, intellectual property protection. When you're putting in a $10 billion asset, you want to make sure that your prop IP is going to be protected. 
And so because of that, I think historically, those investment levels by U.S. companies in China um, have been low. They're changing a little bit um, over time, but still the vast majority of those very expensive uh, fabs are actually not in China today, at least from a, a U.S. company perspective. But the process of making a chip, uh, it's extremely complex. You have at the beginning, you know, you have your materials and silicon or other compound materials are coming from Japanese and Taiwanese companies and German providers. The semiconductor tools are coming from uh, Japan, the United States, uh, the Netherlands, all around the world, different types of countries. And then looking at the design, software, again, you've got all sorts of different players. So if you look across almost every segment of the industry, there's never really one country that dominates at all. It, it's easily dispersed across. And that level of interdependence is the same for whether you're a Japanese firm or a Chinese firm. Well, I'm going to tease on that a little bit. And Aaron, you mentioned the aircraft industry. And so having watched it for a long time, let me ask you about a potential scenario, which is if you look, I forget what it was called, the YF-10 or something, the, the Chinese commercial aircraft of 20 years ago were pretty dreadful. Um, and I always used to feel terror if I had to fly on them. Uh, but during that period, China used its market position to get companies, Boeing, Airbus, uh, Embraer, to agree to co-production in China. And that co-production, um, legitimate and a normal tactic for the aviation industry, in many countries um, taught the Chinese skills in how to make airplanes. So when you look at their latest commercial entry, um, still not maybe up to global standards, but much, much better and on a better path. And the question that some of us would ask on the asymmetry point is, um, if you, uh, if you um, are required to operate in China and you stop operating in China, um, does that affect uh, your, your market share. And if the Chinese are going to squeeze people out, it may not be as much of a problem for companies to have to leave. And the second point, and I think Aaron raised this, is um, one of the things we all worry about is China may very well say to recipients of aid or domestic airlines, you have to buy the domestic aircraft. Um, we've seen that in other examples as well. So I think that affects the, the dependence question is if China's not as big a market, or if the Chinese appear to be behaving unfairly. But I don't know, Aaron, if you want to touch on that one. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 certainly requirements to either localize your production or to be in a joint venture requirement, these are all areas that have broader implications simply beyond just mm -hmm. what innovation is happening in it. These also are among areas that we know the two governments have been talking about. You know, I think the thing to keep in mind in terms of global production uh, supply chains and those kinds of areas is you know, even if China were to move to allowing 100% foreign ownership in every sector, not every company would take advantage mm. of them. Some of them have JV, requirement, uh, JV arrangements that they feel are useful for their companies. Some of them like to localize in those areas. Some of them are in industries where they would prefer not to have to be the face of the company in China. So how it's a, you know, what the requirements are need to go out, but that then needs to enable foreign companies to choose the model that works for them. And that's probably going to differ based on both by industry as well as by individual company. So I would argue this is a perfect example of how what the Chinese are going to do will dramatically, you know, dramatically is too strong, will harm global innovation in the, in the uh, aviation industry. So if you think about what both Airbus and Boeing did in the sort of last big iteration, they made huge bets. Boeing has spent billions and billions of dollars to perfect carbon fiber air, aircraft uh, frames and uh, all these other innovations. Airbus didn't want the other way. Airbus lost. They, they, they bet they bet the wrong way, but that's what innovation is, fine. We're not gonna, if we're in a world where my son or daughter are flying a 787 in 30 years, I'm gonna be really troubled because I want continuing aviation innovation. And one of the ways you do that, there's a reason why we only have two aviation companies in the world, by and large, making bigger planes. We got sort of Embraer and, and um, 
uh, the Canadian one. Yeah, the Bombardier. Well, Bombardier. Yeah. So we got, you know, but basically we have two, and there's a reason you have two, because the fixed costs and the R&D costs, the upfront costs are so great, you can't afford to have three players in the global marketplace. That would be unnatural and totally wasteful. Companies won't be able to make enough money to reinvest all the money they need to do to the next generation. Chinese are gonna have a third player. Now that third player might just only take over 90% of the Chinese market and then a whole bunch of the Kazakhstan market and all the other Belt and Road markets because they're gonna pressure and subsidize them. But that is gonna cut into Airbus and Boeing sales. And that's going to have a negative effect on their ability to get that next plane out there. And I agree with Aaron. Companies should be able to do, you know, leaving aside defense issues, pretty much whatever they want to do in China. But they shouldn't be forced to do it. And they shouldn't be up against competitors who are massively subsidized or had the technology sold. That's the fundamental issue. It's not about China innovating. It's not about China pro progressing. It's about not the ends, but it's about the means. Uh, more questions? We got to hold up your hand, please. Surely you're not stunned into silence. Uh, we've got two on the side over there. Could you, space. could you repeat the question? I Sorry, can. can you hear me now? Yes. All right, so I'm um, Robert Rasmussen from the uh, Department of Commerce. And my question is about uh, what kind of developments are you seeing uh, towards uh, semiconductor independence with military and space-based applications? Uh, independence by China? Yes. Okay. Well, um, so one of the goals we had for many uh, years, at this point probably a couple decades, was to uh, hamper the Chinese ability to build those kind of specialized chips in order to preserve a military advantage. Um, I don't think that program, <coughs> pardon me, worked out as we hoped, largely because the quality you need is either specialized and the Chinese can make it, as you heard from Jimmy, or the uh, two or three generations back is sufficient for military purposes. So if you look at our own aircraft, uh, they're using technology that might now be almost 20 years old, right? So I don't think that uh, the, this, is a, this is a specialized market where I think the Chinese will probably be able to do pretty well if they want. You know, uh, Jim, going back, I think, to the uh, you know, China question about what do we do in terms of the, you know, the U.S. That's industry. That's my last question. Um, <laughs> I guess I'm jumping the gun a little bit. No. Um, but I think it, it's, um, we have to, you know, the, U the U.S. industry has actually been in a position mm -hmm. where we had a significant competitor we had a lot of state support, and that was back in, in Japan in the 1980s. And mm. so a lot is different today, which I, I don't think we, we can compare that. Right. Um, the Japan market was fully closed. The China market today is fully open. Japanese companies are actually ahead of U.S. companies. We're still ahead today. So there's a lot of differences. But you know, I think there is one similar and some lessons learned in that, uh, you know, that the key to U.S. regaining the lead was really when the Congress and the administration decided to set up something called Semitech with the U.S. industry, investing, uh, I think, in 1980s dollars, hundreds of millions a year, in an effort to try and revitalize, um, particularly on the semiconductor tool side, uh, areas where we had gaps in technology. And that really helped uh, um, catch up and, frankly, um, look in different directions that uh, Japan wasn't focused on because their companies were all building DRAMs and we decided to do things completely differently and build entire new markets. And so I think coming back to you know, where I ended before in my opening remarks, um, you know, there's things that we can do to address uh, issues that have raised by China. First, intellectual property protection has to be paramount. And then second, through the trade deal, trying to uh, bring more of a level playing field, um, particularly when it comes to things like subsidies, disclosure of IP. Um, but really, you know, I think we need to think back to um, things like Semitech. What can we do today to invest in the future? You know, DARPA has a new program. I think you meant, it's mentioned in your report, yeah. the Electronics Resurgence Initiative, um, investing 1.5 billion over roughly, uh, 1.3 billion over five years. That's a really good start. Um, and I think there's a lot more that we can do there, particularly when it comes to basic R&D. That, that was going to be my last question, so let's come back to that one, because I think we had one more over there, is that right? Uh, please, and please identify yourself. Hi, Emily Fang, NPR. Um, one question for Aaron. I'm wondering what 
countries on the West Coast, U.S. semiconductor companies are doing to prepare for any sort of addition to export controls that might be announced later this year. And then maybe one for Jimmy. You've talked about how China has made significant strides in some of the lower end semiconductor products, things like IoT sensors, MEMS. Given the global trend towards connected devices, smart devices, things like that, is that, they're low end, but is that an important piece mm. of the semiconductor industry? Thanks. So Jimmy, I'll let you take the specifics on what the semiconductor industry is doing. Generally, what industry is doing is, frankly, wait for the Department of Commerce to get a little more specific on what's going to be covered by these new export controls. The potential for expansion to cover technologies that go well beyond what has traditionally been covered, I think, is large, both in terms of the first round that we're going to see on emerging technologies, but particularly in, in terms of how they define what foundational technologies are. They, they are in itself, um, by definition, things that many companies are already using and probably exporting fairly freely. So right now, there's really not a whole lot companies can do without knowing what the specific regulations are going to be. There's a lot of education that's going on, I think, within companies, uh, both in terms of investigating internally what their own productions are, what's the nature of uh, the products that they make and their business relationships in China and in other markets to try to be able to respond once commerce comes out with a specific proposal. So, so just to add upon that, I think, you know, um, so the SIWE made a submission to uh, the most recent uh, request for um, information from the Department of Commerce on their uh, emerging technology controls. Um, and, you know, I think at, at a high level, the most really critical factor that, that we want the U.S. government to think about is, um, you know, export control is, is something that uh, for, for decades has been an essential tool for national security. And it's really critical that they don't use export control as a tool to address a trade problem. Um, and we want to be able to isolate um, those two issues on separate tracks. We have the trade dialogue to take care of our trade issues. And when it comes to national security issues, that's really where the lane of export control is. And, and within that lane, they need to think very hard about how do they narrow and specify what they're doing to have the most uh, minimal amount of blowback on, uh, on U.S. industry. Because while we have half of the market today, the other half is non-U.S. companies. And going back to interdependence, there's really no segment in the industry that's dominated entirely by U.S. companies. And so if the U.S. acts unilaterally, in this space, um, then they're really just going to end up uh, hurting innovation here in the U.S. and China's still going to get the technology that they're concerned about. Um, so, you know, I, I think what we did is laid down um, some core principles that, you know, while we respect the concerns of, of, of the U.S. government and, and they need to be taken very seriously, they have to first and foremost think about that the competitive nature of our industry, us being successful, should itself be a uh, a national security concern. Let's not do something that's going to inadvertently harm that for the sake of you know, trying to slow something down in one space. There's an innate tension in the regulation, and this appeared in the negotiations on the FIRMA legislation as well, which is the primary target, the intended target, and perhaps the only target is China, and China's ability to acquire technologies of national security significance our current export control system will not be as effective in stopping that outflow, right? And there's a reluctance, I think, to take that step back and say, what we have now is the same system we had in the early 1990s. Oddly enough, a 20th century system doesn't work that well. What a shock. But there's a reluctance to, to do this kind of rethink. That's legitimate. Uh, companies are worried. That it will be, there are some parts of the government that would prefer a very broad uh, catch on China, and that would have a harm uh, to industries around the world. At the same time, the relationship is such that I think you'll see uh, a desire for increased controls. And so, what I'm hearing, I don't know if you guys are hearing this too, is the shutdown didn't help, but it will be three to six months before we see the response. And then it will probably be another three to six months before we can see anything that looks like a regulation. And I, my bet is that first generation regulation will not address the problem we want to address. So 
this will be something that will probably play out over the rest of the administration. But again, we have to think about you know the unintended consequences. Sure. You know, going back a year ago, we all know what happened with CTE. Not out of coincidence, China announced several hundred million dollar programs to accelerate the localization of a lot of the 5G components. And so, you know, we're going to just drive them to yeah. be better, more independent of us uh, because of that. I think that's something we need to think about uh, because at the end of the day, do we want American chips over there or do we want Chinese ones? Uh, and do we want to maintain that scenario or do we want to drive them away from it? And that's where uh, we'll stop beating this one. But yeah, I, just, I just quickly, I'm just, I just want to, I, I just want to put my marker down with Jimmy on that. I mean, we completely agree with that. I, I think one of the biggest and most important things we can do is everything possible for the U.S. to take global market share away from the Chinese. And if that means selling to the Chinese, then by definition, we're getting market share. They're not. That's the thing that is going to drive our innovation leadership the most. And, and so I, I completely understand there may be some components in there that have to be controlled because of pretty clear defense issues, but there's a real risk you can go too far and cut off our ability to sell. And again, coming back to the multilateral part of it, sure. whatever the U.S. government does, again, hopefully narrow, very limited to uh, what they're trying to achieve in, a, in, in the narrow, not trade space, uh, has to be done with allies. Uh, and I think to the broader point, you know, if you look at uh, Made in China 2025, targeting uh, automobile, shipbuilding, uh, aerospace, semiconductors, these are issues that our allies face um, on a daily basis, for example, in Japan and South Korea. And I think the U.S. government has a tremendous amount of room uh, to work with those allies. And, you know, looking back on areas where we've actually made progress with China in terms of rolling back problematic regulations, Every time it's been in concert with Europeans, Japanese, um, and other countries trying to push back because when China realizes they've kind of gone over the margin and um, uh, they've got not only the United States but many <coughs> other countries to criticize them, uh, they actually tend to retreat. Uh, and so again, whether it's uh, trade or national security related, it has to be in concert uh, with their allies. So one thing, just as a general point, and you're seeing this now in the discussion of uh, Huawei and the allied reaction to it, um, a lot of the media reporting is wrong. Um, there is a good consensus between the U.S. and its key allies. The Germans might be the outlier here uh, on where the risk is. There's less consensus on what needs to be done, but I think that in private, and some of our close allies do not wish to openly confront China. They're happy to hide behind the U.S., but in private, um, they are willing to look for cooperative solutions. And particularly in this space, in what you'd call the uh, emerging technologies, there's more consensus that may be apparent to the naked eye. One of the uh, dilemmas we have, though, is we've built a global supply chain since the export controls were put in place, and it will be very hard to disentangle that, and it's probably not in our interest. Right, so how you put export controls on a global system it will be difficult. Where people are leading is, and you see this in many areas, I'll use the example of Chinese students. Um, there's a general acceptance that Chinese students, Chinese workforce, some of them will take technology back, and that creates leakage, that creates risk. But people, and this echoes, I think, a point Jimmy made, people say, my goal is to mitigate that risk. My goal is to limit the damage. And I believe I can come up with systems, whether it's in telecom or education or semiconductors, that will let, it, let me mitigate the risk of technology leakage. And the question I always ask is, would you rather have them here working for us or they're working for them, right? And in 80% of the cases, if it's an 80-20 trade, which is a educated guess, um, we do better by remaining open. But it's going to be very hard to map these old school export controls onto a very different global economy. Boy, that was a long subject. You clearly hit the wrong button. Uh, <laughs> any more questions? Uh, go, we have uh, two in the front, and then we'll do a closing remarks on what the US can do. Uh, we got one up here and one up here. Yeah. And please identify yourself. Hi, uh, Scott Thompson from Samsung. Um, on the state subsidization question uh, on the Chinese front, uh, I take Aaron's point that it's unsustainable, but I assume that implies unsustainable at its current rate in the semiconductor field. So if and when China reaches a certain level of competitiveness on DRAM or anything else, uh, how much can we project ahead that there will be a de de uh, curtailment in that subsidization rate? 
uh, or would it continue at current rates to try to undercut the, undercut the market and pricing internationally, um, keeping in mind that otherwise it might you know, sink under its own weight. So how much variance is there in the path for Chinese state level subsidization in the semiconductor field as we model ahead the, the future? So, you know, I think despite the, you know, the press reports that, you know, Made in China 2025 is changing in name and so on, it's still full speed ahead in terms of uh, domestic semiconductor capacity um, investment within China. And I think the only thing that's going to constrain investment, particularly from a government space, is going to be a macro slowdown where, um, you know, they, they need to be forced to make decisions over where they're going to spend their money. Uh, and they're going to probably spend money when if it's constrained in things like pensions and education to keep people happy. And actually, also the interesting thing about semiconductors is uh, while we're very important technology, our workforce direct footprint, particularly in fabs, is actually quite small. Um, and so you don't actually create uh, immediate jobs inside the fab, but you enable a lot more through the through the technology. And so China can still get that enablement by using chips from countries around the world. Um, and that brings actually more jobs and growth to the economy than direct contribution from semiconductor employment. Um, so so I, I think the short of it is though that um, particularly in things like memory production like you mentioned, this is such a high priority for the state. I don't, I don't see that um, the state support um, going away anytime soon. In fact, um, you know, the China Exim Bank, China Development Bank uh, president are visiting these factories every day saying you've got a green light from us, whatever you need you're going to get. Uh, and the state saying, um, eh, competition, success, we measure that in a 20-year time frame. Um, so, you know, we'll see. That's a long time. But, um, you know, I think what will happen is um, some of these projects where it's the older technology, the funding for those is going to dry up, um, whereas projects that have more promise where they start to make inroads into the market, government will keep those investments alive. Um, and, you know, one final point is it was in... Um, China uh, last month and uh, meeting with one of the big state-owned chip makers and you know they said well you know our fab here really the government doesn't look like doesn't look at it as a commercial entity it's basic infrastructure mm -hmm. and basic infrastructure doesn't necessarily need to be profitable because it provides a greater good uh, for, for the industry and so they have a when it comes to uh, you know the government involvement completely different perspective so we can't even raise the gas tax five cents in the U.S. because there'd be a political uproar, supposedly, and you get voted out of office. Chinese don't face any of that, zero. They can do whatever they want. We also have to remember in 10 to 12 years, the Chinese economy will be twice the size it is today, which means twice the amount of government money. They could cut this rate in half, and they'd still have the same amount of money. I don't think they face any constraints, other, other than some sort of massive credit explosion uh, because they're over-leveraged. But just in an, as long as things kind of proceed quasi normally, I, I just don't think there's any constraints. I think you just keep doing whatever they want to do. Aaron, you touched on this a little bit, but the, the question about, and Jimmy touched on it too, Japan as a model for what could happen to China. So in thinking about this investment question, maybe you could also discuss that. Uh, I mean, when I look at their debt, uh, yeah, but there's so many things that are very different in terms of how China's economy functions in Japan. I've always been reluctant to use that as the model. Yeah. I mean, certainly the, the risk of, um, of over-subsidization and kind of allowing your companies to, um, to be dominant in your domestic market and not consider yeah. what that looks like in terms of um, global competition, I'd say, is short-sighted. And uh, I think though, that China, China likes to study what the previous models have been. So I, I think those that are setting policy are aware of what they mm -hmm. think the risks are that created those problems, and they are actively seeking to avoid them. Great. Uh, we had one more question in the front, I think. And please identify yourself. Thanks. I'm Jeff Ferry with the Coalition for a Prosperous America, although I think my question reflects an earlier time in 1999. I worked for Nortel, which at the time had 95,000 employees. Five years later, it went bankrupt, and today Huawei dominates that market, as you know. And when I look at a Huawei networking system, I find it really hard to find anything they have developed internally in those systems. So I, I guess my question is, I find um, some of you on the panel, with the exception perhaps of Robert, to be complacent about the chip industry because when I look at the chip industry, 
You need three things. You need to know the direction of innovation, which comes from knowing your customers. All of the chip industry's major customers outside of defense are today building in China, so they're there. Secondly, you need technologists, and, and this is where I disagree with you. We are training them in American universities right now, in most of the graduate departments and most engineering departments, half the students are Chinese, and a significant number are going home, as you said. And thirdly, you need capital, which they've already got. And then if I, you know, I would just look at the chip industry, which has got gross margins of 60 to 80 percent, they're soft like the guys at Nortel. Compare it to the steel industry, those are tough guys working on 20% gross margins. They've all been decimated by the Chinese. So, you know, looking at all that, if I was an investor, I'd say in 10 years, more than half of the chip industry is going to be in China, and Silicon Valley is gonna be full of unemployed people, and you're gonna be able to buy a house in Palo Alto for less than you can buy one in Baltimore. Well, that would be great. Let's use that as a lead into the, what I hope would be the concluding round of discussions, which is what should the U.S. do back? I am going to put a footnote in here, which is there was a book that came out, and some of you have heard me say this before, in 1968, uh, entitled Will the Soviet Union Survive Until 1984? And at the time it came out, all of the responsible analysts ridiculed it and said it was silly. How could this person possibly write this? He was off by five years. And, his opening line was, people make an assumption that things now are better than they were 10 years ago, and therefore 10 years from now they will be better than they are now. And I'm not comfortable with that assumption. I'd, I've never heard Jimmy called complacent, though, so maybe we'll let him. Yeah, okay. I apologize. I have to run to get a plane, so okay. do you mind if I go first and then I will? Yes, I do um, mind. No, go okay, ahead. Good. All right, I'm not going to say anything then. Forget it. I will bow out. Um, it's some, in some way, it's, I, I think it's not you know, all that important whether you're right or other, the more you know, people who are more optimistic are right. If we're a betting country, if you're a company and you face it, you assume it's going to happen. And so if, we, if we're a country and we assume it's going to happen, that tells us that we should wake up and we should do things. And so whether it's going to happen, whether they're going to fail, I don't care. I think there's a risk of it. The risk is not de minimis, and therefore we better wake up and do some things. And what I would say we need to do, and, and I'll leave aside the China part because we've written extensively about that. I just testified and sent it on that yesterday. There's a million things we could do on China. Jimmy or Aaron can talk about it. But domestically, we tend to ignore that. We tend to have this view, if we just go after China, everything's hunky-dory. The opposite is also not true, too. If we don't go after China, everything's not hunky-dory. So what can we do? Number one, what we forget about in the 80s, it's, uh, I was here in the 80s, what you forget about is there was a massive bipartisan push to put in place a suite of advanced technology and competitiveness policies. We created the Research and Development Tax Credit under Reagan. As late as when Clinton took office, it was the most generous R&D credit in the world. It's now 27th least generous. So we ought to be doubling the R&D credit instead of what Congress did, which weakened it in the last tax bill. They did some other good things in the tax bill, but they weakened the R&D credit. We should double the R&D credit from 14 to 28%. Secondly, Jimmy talked about Semitech. We, there's also was, was the Focus Center, and now it's Star... Starnet and Jump. Starnet. That program should be twice as big. This is a DARPA program with industry. We should be funding... Uh, if, you look, if you look, for example, at, at PhD fellowships that NSF gives in this space, they're dramatically lower than what they were 20 years ago. We need to be funding PhD fellowships in this area. You look at federal funding of R&D, we, we just had a little report on this. If we had the same share of federal R&D to GDP ratio, which is the right measure, and we wanted to match that from the mid-1990s, mid-1980s, 87, let's say, you would have to double federal R&D today. We're talking about a $120 billion shortfall. And in physics, in physical sciences, where semiconductors is based, less so in biology, that shortfall is even bigger. So there's a boatload of things we need to do. And just sort of assuming that we have great companies, we do have great companies, but this is about an innovation ecosystem that companies rely on to be able to build on their own capacity. So I, I think we just have to wake up and say it's time for us to do that. Now, I'm a little optimistic because we're seeing a little bit of that now, particularly in the Senate on, on a bipartisan way, where you're seeing Republicans and Democrats beginning more to talk about this. But I think if we don't do that, we're going to regret it in five or 10 years. Uh, Aaron, do you want to? Uh, you have to run, Rob? Well, thanks for coming. A literal mic drop. <laughs>
Um, <laughs> yeah, please don't drop the mic, it'll break. <laughs> um, I, I, I agree with Rob that I think that the, the combination of things that we have to do is to continue to go after policies, be they in China or any other market in the world, where they clearly are distorting or creating conditions in which it is, there is unfair competition. But at the same time, we've got to be looking domestically at what we can be doing. Um, I am, I am a, will wrap myself in the flag and say that I think that American companies can out innovate, but they can't do that solely, as Rob pointed out, in, in an environment where we're relying on the companies to be able to do that. Looking at workforce retraining, having a workforce that is genuinely nimble, that can be employed at whatever the new emerging industries in the United States are going to be. We, seem ha we sometimes, uh, or frequently I guess I would even say, think that trade policy is going to solve the problems that we have in our domestic economy without recognizing that our economy is dynamic and large enough that we can't assume that it is always someone else's problem that is causing us to not be as uh, growing as fast or changing in ways that we want. It has to be the combination. So I would add to that, you know, to quote, you know, one of the founders of Intel, Andy Grove, you know, only the paranoid survive. And so, you know, absolutely, you know, U.S. chip companies are not complacent when it comes to China. And, you know, at the SIA, this is one of the topics that's discussed the most intensively is how do we maintain our competitive advantage? How do we have a fair market? Um, and I think when it comes to China, you know, again, it's focusing on the issues that are going to be uh, of concern, whether it's subsidies, whether it's intellectual property protection, and ensuring that we don't have a broad brush approach, slapping tariffs on everything, and then assuming that's going to solve our problem. It's what's the most uh, acute issue that's impacting the industry, protection of IP, and ensuring that we have a level playing field. And then we also have to ensure that whatever we do when it comes to China, we do so in concert with our allies. I think we're really missing a massive opportunity to go even further. If you think about it, you know, we've been able to, in these talks of China, if uh, the administration officials uh, are saying so, achieve more than we have before, just imagine if we had seven or eight countries behind us in concert. We'd be able to push even further. Um, and, in, and in terms of, uh, you know, uh, investing in our future, I think that's really, at the end of the day, um, we can't, you know, we can't win without um, being able to invest in our future, and we, we can't do either or. As Rob said, we have to do both. Um, and we can easily triple, quadruple funding that we have in semiconductors uh, in terms of federal government research. It's actually hard to n measure the number, but roughly a billion annually mm -hmm. in federal government dollars is going into semiconductor-specific programs uh, like DARPA's ERI program, like the StarNet Jump program out of National Science Foundation. There's, you know, for example, the Jump program, uh, they get applications for uh, from universities around the United States for uh, technology research and they have to leave on the table 50, 70 projects because they just don't have the funding. But these are good projects that they could fund if they had the money. Um, and, you know, the other, you know, component is really thinking about their workforce and that, it, you know, today half of our uh, students, graduate students in engineering and physical sciences are, are foreign born uh, within that Chinese Indian students, others uh, make up a, a significant portion of that. So um, we need to be doing more as a country to encourage students to have an interest in STEM degrees because right now the challenge a lot of our companies have is a uh, fresh graduate coming out of MIT wants to work for, you know, innovative startup company selling, uh, you know, cool e-commerce tools, not building chips because uh, it's not seen as sort of the sexy new field that, that, that's uh, attracting students. Same is true for space. Um, and, and that's a serious problem because, for example, uh, talking to one of our member companies and they have a chip that's in hot demand in 5G, uh, but the engineering knowledge on that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and once these engineers retire, no one's left uh, to, to design these chips for the future. And they go to the universities and there aren't even an American study the technology they need for communications, millimeter wave chips, and so on. So, uh, you know, we have to be able to ensure we've got the people to uh, keep the lights on in the companies, and then we have to ensure that we bring back the level of investment we did um, uh, in terms of federal government research to ensure that we're really um, elongating the lead that we have today. Because again, semiconductors is not like these other uh, areas, uh, you know, that have seen unfortunate disaster like telecom hardware in the U.S., uh, 
not a single company's left doing uh, front end base stations at the edge. It's all European, Chinese. And so we want to avoid that situation. We have the, uh, I guess, benefit of seeing now lessons learned, what not to do. And I think um, you see uh, a lot more focus on IP protection. In particular, because we have the experience, we can look back at other sectors and see what happened. So I think we came out with some common themes here. I mean, one of them is that uh, you guys were a little more optimistic that the Chinese will eventually get where they're going. Uh, I'm probably a little more skeptical, uh, although I don't underestimate them at all. And in an ideal world, we would be partners. Um, we talked a little bit about the risk of Chinese investment to the global semiconductor and innovation infrastructure. If it's done the right way, it would be a benefit, but if it's done in a very mercantilist way, there could be real harm. And we came, this is probably a bad sign, we came more or less to a consensus on what the U.S. ought to be doing. And I think for me, the fundamental change from 20 years ago is that uh, if you have a policy where the goal is to shrink government spending on public goods like R&D, like infrastructure, it will be hard to keep up with the Chinese or, or stay in front of them. So um, on education, I'll just note that when I teach at a university, I always ask the undergraduates, if I offered you a full ride in STEM, would you do it? It's almost 100% response positive, right? You want more engineers, you want more scientists, pay them. Uh, but that's where we have trouble as a country, and I think all of us have said that. The good news is that's fixable. Um, this was a great panel. Uh, please join me in thanking them. Thank you.